So Mark chapter 14 and verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Just quieten your hearts before the Lord as we commit this time to him now. Lord Jesus, we honor you and bless you, we worship your holy name. Hmm, God, we feel your presence in this place, Lord God. And as we bow down and worship you, we pray that even as we open our hearts to you, you would deposit truth within us today that is relevant for our season in life. I pray that your people will grow. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord God, to become more like you today. I pray for this vessel you're using today. Work through me, I pray, in the name of Jesus, to bless your people and to edify your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Clap your hands one more time. <laughs> Smile at your neighbor and you may take your seat. So I like to share with you the, the, the key message that the Lord has for us, and I'm going to do that right now. It's simply this. Let's work towards agape love, the God kind of love. Let's say that together. Let's work towards agape love, the God kind of love. Now, as we were planning uh, the messages for this year, we figured out that this would be, uh, around about now, would be Valentine's Day. And so I thought, uh, as I was seeking the Lord, that it would be good to give a perspective on love as in the culture we enter into Valentine's Day. I want to read from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, uh, just to open up the thought here. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now in the original language that the New Testament was written, the word for love here is, is actually more specific. It is a word that means the God kind of love. Okay, we, some of us have heard that word agape. Well, it means the God kind of love and it is God's spirit within us and only God's spirit within us that enables us to be able to exhibit the God kind of love. And so, at the end of this message, here's what I hope God will do by the power of his spirit. I hope that he would have us praying 
to become more like Jesus in terms of the way that we love. Even as we go into Valentine's Day this week and in the culture, there's another kind of love that's happening there. Um, we want to ask God to give us more of the God kind of love. But now, on the way to that goal, as we go through the sermon, uh, we, we're gonna go through some stories and I want to paint a word picture of different types of love. Because there are different types of love. And in doing that, I'm hoping that we'll have a contrast between those different types of love and the God love. That, that in fact, by doing that, it will actually make the point of the end goal for us to have more of the God kind of love. Now, how many of you have friends? Just wave your hand if you have friends. You have friends? Okay, good. Amen. Wonderful. Yes. Good, good. Now I'm acting like I can see you. I cannot see anything. So um, if you have friends, that's good. How many of you have been hurt at some point in your life by a friend? Okay. So, so yeah, just by the noise, I can, I can imagine that there's quite a few people. Um, there's an article that I, I was reading uh, actually some time ago, a few years ago actually, and um, what it, it talks about is three different types of friendship. And it, it's accredited to Aristotle, actually. He says there are three different types of friendship. He calls them pleasure, utility, and virtue. So I decided to simplify this for myself so that it would make sense to me. And so what it means is uh, you are my friend because you give me pleasure. That would be the first type of friendship that he talks about. You are my friend because you give me pleasure. And then the second type that he talks about is this. You are my friend because I can use you to get something that I want. Okay, that's the second type of, of friendship. You are my friend because I can use you to get something that I want. And then there's the third type of friendship, the virtue one, you are my friend because I want the very best for you. That's the third type of friendship. And so, I, looking at these definitions, I mean, I think they do capture reality if you think about it, but I also think that they're very harsh. I, as I thought about it, they're crisp, but they're harsh. And so, I borrowed from a message that I heard a number of years ago, you'll see the reference in your bulletins, where the preacher actually outlined three types of friends that you will meet in your life. Uh, three faces of love, if you will. He said the, the, the first is what he called constituent. Everybody say constituent. So the constituent is for what you are for. You say I'm for this, the constituent beside you, your friend, is for this as well. He's for or she is for what you are for. That's the constituent. The second type of friend that he talked about was the comrade. Now, the comrade is against what you are against. Okay, that's the second one, the comrade. This is the type of friendship where your friend is against the same thing that you are against. And then the third type of friend that he talked about is the confidant. And the confidant is for you. They are your friend because they love you. They're not as much concerned about what you are for or what you are against. They are concerned about you. That's the third type of friendship that he speaks about. And so, if we look at our gospel story, we're gonna see that these three types of friends showed up in the life of Jesus. And as you listen to the message, I want you to think about the friends in your life. All right, I'm gonna do it again just, just to make sure that we're in the same place. How many of you have friends? Raise your hand, okay? I want you to think about your friends in your life. 
and try to answer this question as we go through this message. Why are they my friends? Why are they my friends? Why are they with me? Because I think what it will do is it will help us to be able to manage our expectations of those that we call friends. Okay? And if we can manage our expectations of those that we call friends, it is going to save us from a lot of hurt. Simply because we know what type of friends we have, and therefore we know what type of expectations that we should place on those friends. Amen. So now Jesus knew his friends. You're going to see that he knew the type of friends that he had. And he knew he had expectations of the friends that he had. And we want to learn from Jesus. That's what we're doing here. So as Christians, if we can spend less time being hurt and more time being excited about spreading the gospel message, I think that'll be a good thing for the church. Don't you? But I don't want us to just be looking outward. As we go through these different types of friendships today, think about what type of a friend am I? So I have friends, right? What type of a friend am I to my different friends? Think about that. And I hope that as we think about that, it's gonna help us to think about, okay, how can I become more like Jesus in the friendships that I have? We're going to talk first about a guy called Judas. Judas was a constituent. He served with Jesus until he found others who he thought were better positioned than Jesus was. Right? So in verse 43 we read, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, Judas served with Jesus for most of his ministry. In fact, Judas was the trusted one with the money. He was the treasurer. And as I thought about that, I thought, actually, from the information given in the gospel, it's probably Matthew who would have been better suited for that. Matthew was actually a tax collector. He counted money and he took it. So, so if you wanted somebody to be the treasurer, it would be somebody who had that type of skill. But we see that that wasn't the case. It was Judas who was the treasurer. Now, sometimes we, we look at Judas and we, we say, ah, maybe Judas had a raw deal, right? If, if this was prophesied, maybe Judas had to do what he had to do so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. Um, if you had Bible study on Wednesday evening, you would have heard Brother James give an excellent exposition on why that's not the case. But I want to just read from you, uh, for, for you from John chapter 12, verses 5 to 6, because it tells us the character of Judas the Constituent. When Mary anointed Jesus' feet with some expensive oil, Judas said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Good question. However, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So get it clear in your mind. Judas was in it for himself. That's what he was in it for, right to the end. Judas was in it for himself. And so he knew where to find Jesus because he was familiar with Jesus' movements. He was an insider. And in fact, he had eaten with Jesus earlier that night, that intimate Passover meal where Jesus washed their feet. He had eaten that meal. Now there's a, a Latin saying, noscitur a socis, and it means you are known by your associates. I just need to look at who you're with and I'll know who you are. And so when Judas appears on the scene, with the temple guards and the folks from the, the, the Pharisees and so forth, and they got their clubs and sticks and everything, you can see 
by his change in his associates, you can see who Judas is. Verse 44, now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now this play was very, very smooth. If you recall, at another place in the scripture, there was a time when they wanted to seize Jesus and throw him over the cliff. But the Bible says he slipped away through the crowd. But now, in this particular instance that we read of, in Gethsemane, it was dark. It, it, when Jesus slipped through the crowd, it had been light. Now it was dark. It should have been easier for Jesus to be able to slip away through the crowd. But not with his constituent on the other side. Because you see, Judas knew who he was. So as he slipped, Judas could have slipped with him. Judas knew who he was. And, and, and when Judas came up to Jesus to kiss Jesus, I mean, remember earlier on, Jesus had said to Judas, go and do what you must do quickly? Well, the disciples, what did they think? They thought that Jesus was just sending him on an errand. So when he shows up, there's no reason to doubt him. They didn't know. And so him coming up to Jesus to give him a kiss, nobody's going to stop him. It seems normal. However, Judas was using familiarity to betray Jesus. Verse 46, the men seized Jesus and arrested him. The hand that helped Jesus to influence people becomes a hand that hindered him when he changed to somebody else who was looking for influence. Constituents. Now I once worked in a particular company. There were three lines of business. And when I joined that company, I was working for one of the lines of business, and my boss was supporting all three lines of business. And so we put some things together, we made some changes, got some great results, uh, and we praised God for it, it was awesome. Well, he wasn't praising God, I was praising God. It was awesome, and we got some great results. Within, I think it was nine months, uh, the president called me in and gave me a promotion. Yay! And you know who he promoted me into? He promoted me into my boss's position. Now, but it was a good story. My boss then moved over to run one of the lines of business, one of the other lines of business. So now I was supporting three lines of business, and now my former boss was running one. So we were peers. Anyway, I put together the plan thinking, man, this is great. I have a friend, and we've had some good results together. I put my plan together, and I went and presented it and said, these are the things we need to do. We, need, we can fix this particular problem that's a big problem. He took me aside afterwards, and we went and have a, a, a sandwich. He invited me nicely to... I thought my friend is inviting me for a sandwich. And uh, he will deny this until we get to glory, uh, which is what they do. But here's what he told me. He said, we've been working on that problem for over 30 years. Don't think that you can come in as a newbie and solve something that we've been failing to solve for 30 years. He was a constituent, right? When, it, when we were for the same thing, it was good. When it seemed as though we were for different things, he was no longer my friend, and he didn't even tell me. You build on constituents. Sorry, you don't build on constituents. Constituents, you build with constituents. Let me explain that because that's really important. Um, because this is where you're going to apply this in your life. If, if, if you're say, let's say that you are an athlete and you're, you're training for the Olympics and you have a partner that you're training with for the Olympics. So you're both for going to the Olympics, you're both for doing well in the Olympics. What you must understand is that. You're training with this partner, and if you discern this, it's very important for you to understand this, that you're, you're training with your partner, but your partner actually wants to become better so that they can succeed. Understand that? So you're training for the Olympics, right? The two of you. Now, if you rely fully on your partner, if you build your success on your partner, 
then what happens is if your partner finds another athlete that they feel they can work better with to get their results, they will drop you like a hot potato. Are we together? So, so your friend, it's good. Train with your friend. And, and do the best that you can to succeed. But understand that if your friend is a constituent type of friend, it's good. Train together. But understand that if they find something better, they're dropping you. And you must understand that if you still want to succeed in going to the Olympics, you cannot rest fully on that friend. So if you understand that, then when they drop you, plan B comes into effect, there's no emotions broken. If you don't understand that, you'll be bitter for a very long time. That doesn't mean that we must not have constituent friends. We must. We must just understand what type of a friend we have. And Jesus understood what type of a friend he had in Judas. He understood that. That's why he could say to Judas, go and do what you're planning to do quickly. He understood him. And so he was not surprised when Judas came. That's the constituent type of friendship. Now the second type of friendship is comrades. And most of the disciples were comrades. They stood with Jesus against oppression until it seemed that the fight was over. You've got to recognize those types of friends in your life. Verse 47, then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. There we have it, right off the bat. Someone's attacking my friend who's from the other side. Strike him, cut off his ear before he gets to strike you. And, and, and another gospel tells us that that was actually Peter. It was Peter in, in actually John chapter 18. We'll see that Peter, his friend, had seen this opposition. He had seen the religious leader trying to, leaders trying to manipulate the people. And so he struck out as a friend. Peter was a comrade in arms. Verse 48, Jesus comes now and says, am I leading a rebellion? You have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Now when Jesus said that, there are two things, at least, that the disciples would have picked up from what he said. The first thing was that there would be no violence. In fact, Jesus went and actually healed the ear of the servant who had been struck by Peter. So the first thing they, they would have seen is, he's not planning on fighting. No violence here. The second thing that they would have discerned when he said, the scriptures must be fulfilled, then they would have understood, uh, okay, he's been talking about dying, the enemies are coming to take him, and he's saying, let it be, the scriptures must be fulfilled, they would have understood that this is over. There's no fight here. And so in verse 50, the Bible says, then everyone deserted him and fled. Do you see? Do you see? Can you understand why they would have fled? I mean, Peter was ready to fight. They were, they were there. They could have done something. But they fled because... There was no fight. There was no longer an opposition. Jesus said, we're not fighting them. We're not. We're not taking them on today like I did before, correcting them, telling them that was wrong. I'm not doing that today. And so they realized that what Jesus had been against and what they had been against, that fight was over, it seemed. It seemed as though everything was now done. And so... They ran away. You can see that they would, especially if it endangered their lives. Comrades. You know, when I was in seminary, I, as part of the program, I took a, a course in, well, it was, more, it was a, a certification, a number of courses, in spiritual direction. And as part of that, we worked, you know, you had a partner that you would work with, and so I met this 
uh, this brother, and we worked together. And as part of it, you, there were reflections, and so we went you know, fairly deep into our spirituality and shared it with one another. And I thought, uh, you know, we, we became friends, and I thought, you know, if you're going to be sharing some of those uh, deeper aspects of you, it can't be just with a stranger. I mean, I, I thought you, you'd need to have some type of a relationship, which we did. And so we, we shared and we worked together, and, 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 and the, the, the degree was in front of us, and we were working together and working towards the degree, and then we, we graduated. That was awesome. And uh, it was difficult. It was like a Goliath, because at that, at that time, uh, you know, my kids were still young, so raising a family, trying to work, traveling, you know, just doing a lot of stuff. It was a busy period in life, so it was difficult. Uh, and so, man, we got it done. I think it was maybe 18 months later, I reached out to my former partner and said to him, hey, why don't we just get together and grab a coffee? Which we did uh, while we were studying. And so uh, I got a note back from him saying, uh, what are we going to discuss? I said to him, nothing in particular, just we can just hang out and encourage each other and talk a little bit. I mean, I, I've shared some of the deepest aspects of my spirituality with this guy. I never heard back from him again. Uh, and why? Because what we were talking about there was a comrade, um, a context-specific friend. They're your friend only in a particular context. Outside of that context, they're not your friend. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. I I'm just saying it is. And so, you build only a segment of your life journey with comrades. You don't build the foundations of a lifetime with comrades. Uh, do you get that? Because this is where you're going to apply it now. When you understand that you have a friend who's a friend with you, because you're both doing something, accomplishing something, and you understand that take away that thing and there's no basis for friendship, then you need to, it's good, you should be friends. I'm not saying you shouldn't be friends. Please understand me. You should be friends. But what I'm saying is that you should understand what you expect from that type of a friendship. It works within that segment of your life, but it is not to be used as the foundation for your whole life. For example... If you have friends and you are single and they're your friends, your bosom buddies, everything is good, and you're good friends, don't, let me, let me put it this way, you need to discern why they are your friends. Because when you get married, some of those single friendships are going to chill out and maybe even disappear because your context has changed. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That, that's, that's so important to understand that so that you don't feel hurt now because somebody's not responding to you the way they did before you were married. The situation has changed. We're talking about comrades in friendship. They are against what you are against. And many of Jesus' disciples they thought that that segment of life, that season was over. That's what they thought. Now, now, you and I know it wasn't. We know the end of the story. But they thought it was over, and so they ran away. Sadly, most of the disciples did not go with Jesus to the end. That's comrades. But then, the third type of friend is the confidant. And John was a confidant. He was for Jesus right to the end. Verse 51, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. I, I've often wondered who this young man was because the Bible doesn't identify him. I've wondered and I've thought, is it possible that that young man was actually James? Now, I'm going to tell you why I thought it might have been James. Jesus had, he had the disciples and then he had the 12 apostles and then he had an inner circle of three friends, Peter and then the brothers James and John, the sons of Zebedee. 
And those guys were, they were his inner circle. So when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, he went with those three guys. In fact, when he was praying in Gethsemane, he left the apostles and went with those three to a separate place, and he prayed with them right there. I mean, it was, there was a different level of intimacy. And I wonder if it wasn't James that had, after all of the, the turmoil and everybody, the Bible says already that they had fled, that the Bible still talks about him following Jesus. But when they grabbed him, he realized that he better gap it. Think about it, naked, he ran away. Verse 53, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and teachers of the law came together. Peter, so that's the second of those three. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. I want you to think about that. So what happened was those guys who went to take Jesus, they took Jesus to the high priest's place. They, they, they took Jesus there. One of those guys Peter had struck with a sword on his ear. You get that? Who had gone there? And so Peter followed Jesus to the place where that guy who was struck was. He followed him there. He was different. He was different. He followed them there. The Bible tells us that um, he, he, he stood at the gate, but then one of the apostles that's identified most likely, most likely as John knew the high priest, and so he arranged for Peter to be able to come inside. Peter went right inside, and <laughs> he struck with a sword. Would you do it? Struck the servant with a sword. Now he's warming his hands by the fire. Dangerous move. But he was interested in Jesus. He was interested in Jesus. But, again, Jesus knew what to expect from that friend. He knew what to expect from his comrade. In fact, he told him, you're going to deny me. Peter says, me, never. Jesus says, I know you. I expect you. That doesn't mean that I don't love you. When you're converted, strengthen your brethren. But he knew the friend that he had. He knew what to expect. And so, just as Jesus had predicted, when it actually came down to brass tacks, and they said, you were with him, Peter turned into a cusser. He cussed, he swore. He swore, I never knew the man. I don't know him. Peter was, Peter was a comrade, but he wasn't a confidant. But then we have John. I mean, John, <laughs> John was a confidant. Watch. John went with Jesus all the way to his death. That's a confidant. He was with Jesus, for Jesus. So much so that Jesus knew, listen to this, what he could expect from John because John and him were like blood. That's a confidant. And so Jesus, when he's dying, one of the last things that he does is he says, woman, behold your son, meaning John, talking to his mother, Behold your mother. And so John took Jesus' mother and cared for her in his home from that day forward. That's a confidant. But I think what's more important than understanding that that's a confidant is understanding how Jesus related to him. He knew this is a confidant. I can trust him. He knew that if I trust Judas with my mother, that's not a good plan. I love Judas. He's my friend. I've made him the treasurer. But I know the limits. He knew if I trust Peter with my mother, especially in the condition he's in right now, she might end up in warfare. Peter's a good guy, but I'm not trusting my mother with you. Jesus knew what to expect of the different types of friends that he had in his life. I got permission to tell you a story about my confidant. Sister Lucy and I met at, at university. 
So just to be plain and clear, yeah, that is my confidant, Sister Lucy. And it's nice when you fall in love with your confidant because, especially when it's Valentine's Day, you can, all right, I, let me just get back to what I'm focused on. So, so, so we met at university, and, um, and so I, I guess maybe it's this way at university, but uh, I wasn't the only one that saw her. So that some of these other guys, they were trying their luck. And, uh, but we were holy. We used to go to chapel and we were Christians and we, we were born again and we, and we spoke in tongues. We were holy. So we realized that, you know, something permanent here is, is very likely. But we decided we're still at school. We decided that we're going to be special friends. Special friends. And so we were special friends. Well, one day we were walking in a group uh, from their residence, I don't know where we were going, but as we, as we were, as we were walking, we're walking together, and there's a group of us, and, and we're chatting, and then there's this guy, he, he bounces around and comes and squeezes himself in between the two of us. And then he's talking to her. I said, okay. Uh, so we, 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 we walked uh, for a little bit, and somehow, we ended up walking together again. Just a few steps, we're walking together again. So he notices that we're walking together again over here. He bounces around and he comes in between the two of us again. And I was, I remember it like it was this morning. I, eventually what I did is I just pulled back and let them continue walking. It was Sister Lucy being, uh, Sister Lucy being Sister Lucy. She's talking to the guy. So they, I let them walk and talk and I back backed off and I just hung out. So she, they walked for a little bit and then she noticed that I wasn't with her. So she turned and she saw me kind of sulking in the background. And so, so what she did, she, she's nice and cool. Just, just didn't talking to the guy, she, but she stopped. Of course, he's hot on her trail, so she stops, he stops. And so they just talking, very nice, so sweetly talking to him. And she waited and, and I walked up, walked up and uh, came, and as I stood beside her, uh, we, we, we carried on walking, and she, ca she carried on talking to him. <laughs> that day he saw, we didn't see him again after that. That day he saw that there was no competition. That day I saw that I had found my soulmate. You see, you build the foundations of your life on confidence. You can trust confidence with your mother. You can trust confidence with your life because they are for you. They absolutely want the best for you. You can build the foundations of your life on confidence, but you must properly identify who a confidant is because you will not have more than just a few confidants in your life. And if you do have a confidant in your life, you're a blessed person. Because those folks are not easy to come by. And so, if you find a confidant, there are two pieces of advice I want to give you. Number one, if you find a confidant, keep them. Keep them. Recognize them for who they are and keep them. Second piece of advice, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a Christ follower, Jesus is your confidant and he is all that you will ever need. And so if you know the love of Jesus, then try to be a confidant to somebody else. Just because you know what it is. If, if nobody else is a confidant for you in this world, if nobody else expresses to you the God kind of love in a way that you can feel it and know this is agape love, know that you have enough in Jesus. You have enough in Jesus. 
We're going to close, so please stand to your feet because we're going to prepare to pray now. You see, we talked, we talked about the types of friends that Jesus had, right? We talked about the types of friends in the scripture that Jesus had. Now, let's talk about the type of friend that Jesus is. Jesus went to Calvary. He gave up his life in its prime, willingly. He said there's no fight here. He went with those religious leaders knowing where he was headed because he had, and it's difficult to comprehend this, but, but try and catch it by faith. He did that because he was thinking about you personally and about me, not even born, wouldn't even be born for two millennia to come, yet he was thinking about you. And he said, I'm going to give myself up. I'm going to shed my blood. I'm going to allow them to take my life. Just so that on the morning of February, what's the day today? 11th? Mm -hmm. 2024? Somebody at Faith Sanctuary can be saved. It's... And because we want to be people who display this type of agape love, let me say this. If you want to be a confidant, here's the best way you can be a confidant. Take an invitation to the harvest to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. That is the best expression of agape love you will ever give. I don't know if you catch that. For somebody to get to know Jesus, for somebody to have the opportunity to hear about Jesus, if you're the one who facilitates that, you are their best friend. It's the best thing that you can do for them. Give them an invitation to the harvest. Amen. That's for the saints that know Jesus. Now, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, um, you, you might ask, well, what's this invitation to the harvest? Like, this gospel, like, well, I don't really understand it. Now, you know, folks, when we, when we are in this place, we sometimes think that people don't ask those questions. They do. Like, you'll be surprised how little people know about the, about the Bible. There are so many people, if they knew it, they would respond. They actually don't know. I'm, I'm like, talk to people. You'll find that out. They actually don't know. And so they, you may be asking that question. Maybe you're online and you're asking that question. What's this gospel about? Well, Peter put it this way in Acts 2.38. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, that language is good for people who read the Bible and understand repent and stuff like that, or even baptize. Most people don't. So let me, let me put it to you in simpler terms. If you're asking what this gospel is about, I want you to know that God loves you. This, this agape love, this confident love I'm talking about, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you, and not only that, he has a wonderful plan for your life. It's his plan for you to have a good life. But you see, the problem is that with humanity, we've sinned against God. And sin has separated us from relationship with God. And so that's the reason Jesus died. We don't fully understand it because it is beyond human capability to understand it. But Jesus died and the reason he died was so that that relationship that we lost with God, we can now come back into relationship with God. That, that, that's what we need to do to access what God has for us. And so what that means is we've been living our lives and we've been doing things our way, 
sinning against God, doing bad things, some things that we know, some things we don't know. And what the Bible is saying is that if I want to reconnect with God, if I want to become a confidant in relationship with God, He loves me already. All I have to do is turn away from what I am doing and turn towards what He says that I should do. That's, that, that's what I've got to do. I've got to make that turn. Once I've turned to Him, what He will do for me is I will go through baptism. I'll go into water, be immersed. And when I come up by faith, all of the sins that I have will be washed away. And I only need to do that once in my life. Everything, all the sins that I've done will be washed away. And then He promises that when that happens, He will come with His own Spirit and come and live in you. And you're saved. You have Him as your confidant. And so, if you are hearing me saying this and you're saying, I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be His friend. I'm going to encourage you to come forward and stand just in the front where Brother Chris is and we're going to pray for you. We'll pray for you so that you can come into right relationship with Jesus and if you so desire, we can baptize you today. But we'll take it one step at a time. Anybody who wants to give your life to Jesus, we'd like you to come here in the middle and you'll have an opportunity for that. Praise God. Now, we have other people that, that, that the Lord is ministering to today in the context of this message. And I, I want you to respond to this because God has, so to speak, stirred the waters. There are many people that you bump into and they have scars because of hurt in friendships that they've had, friendships of different sorts. And maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you had a friend and they let you down. And you know you should get over it, but you can't. Well, this message is about the Lord wants to touch you. He wants to heal you. And so please come forward. If you want prayer for a broken relationship that has caused you hurt, now is the time to come forward. We have the directors and ministers in the front, and they are here to pray for you. Amen. Now, um, I, I do realize that, you know, if you say, well, come forward if you've been hurt, nah, that's, you have to think about it before you respond to it because you don't want to get hurt again because somebody's going to look at you and say, oh, they got hurt. And I understand that. But take your time. As the Lord moves you, we're going to be, we're going to be praying. As the Lord moves you, come. Because he, I'm telling you, Jesus wants to heal you today. Inside. He, he wants to take away that scar that's there and put... Uh, so to speak, new flesh. Amen. So, so come forward for prayer. Amen. I know that we always, yes, people are responding. That's good. Come, because the Lord is doing something. I know we always have folks who need prayer for healing in their bodies. And so if you need healing in your body, you come forward as well. Come forward and uh, the directors will pray for you. Now finally, as I go in to, to pray for you, some of you will not want to respond because, as I say, it's embarrassing. As I pray, if you need prayer for anything in your life, anything, simply come up, but mention to the director or the minister who's praying, just mention what it is you need prayer for, and they will pray for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. And I'm going to pray, and, and when I'm done praying, uh, I will I will kind of just uh, dismiss the service, but not, not what we're doing here. We're going to continue to pray here. The praise team is going to come up and they're going to lead us. Um, but in case you need to go, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dismiss you. But I want you to take the time to pray. Like I want you to take the time to allow the ministry of the Spirit of God in your life. Uh, I'm particularly after those hurts today. God wants to heal you. Open up your hearts to the Lord as we pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for you are holy. Your good and your mercy endures forever. I pray, Lord God, that as your people stand before you, heal us, Lord God. Heal us by the power of your spirit. Touch us, Lord God, and minister to us. We bless you. We worship you. We honor you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Praise God. Amen. The singer